Hey y'all, I'm DJ, and this is a Frequently Asked Questions video. One of the most common questions that I've received in the last several years is in regards to my telephony setup, which permits me to use modems with my vintage systems, and how that becomes a telnet connection, either incoming or outgoing. I've explained this several times over, but there's usually some kind of misunderstanding here or there, and hopefully this explanation will make sense. As a follow-up to this video, I'm going to cover a few ways that this can be done without all the complicated and expensive bits that I use in my setup, so keep an eye out for that video to come in the next couple of weeks or sooner. So let's jump right in, shall we? First of all, this is the entire rack that's been running the operation here for the last six years. And it's a lot to take in, I, I realize this. So let's break this down into parts. The big black box here is a Linux server, which is the PBX for the whole setup. That's the phone switch. This is the cause of confusion for a lot of people, so let me try to explain. There are no telephone company connections of any sort at play here. This box is the phone company for my house. This is not using VoIP to do this, and even though that is the first thing that people tend to think of when they think of Astra Software PBX, everything here is using proper circuit switch telephony with time division multiplexing over T1 trunks to another device that I'll explain later. The Asterisk server provides all the dial tone, all the switching, all the hunt group selection, etc. Just above that is the Zilogix Annex 3 terminal server. For those that don't know, a terminal server is a device that allows serial and parallel devices to be accessed via TCP IP. There are many different types, this just happens to be my favorite. I have terminals and modems connected to the Annex, and we'll cover some of those right now. Sitting just on top of the Annex, you can see the US Robotics Courier Dual Standard. This is the modem that is currently used when you telnet to my BBS. We'll talk more in detail about that in a bit. On the right side is a Reykjavik VA3451 modem, which I use for my 110 BPS connections from my teletypes that have datasets or modems connected to them. This lets me connect those teletypes to things on the network. In between them is a spare connection which gets used for occasional terminal connections. On the bottom here we see the Multitech CC1416 modem rack. This is a rack of modems that are used by the originate side for Diversidial. When you telnet into DDoW, one of these modems is selected to carry your call. Just above that is a Cisco Ethernet switch, which ties the items together on the network side. And at the top of this picture is a rack mount UPS that keeps everything running smoothly. Next up the stack are the Apple IIe's, which make up the three nodes of our Mac Diversidial. Each of these systems have a number of modems in them and are networked together. Each has the potential to handle up to eight users, one on each of the seven expansion slots, and one on the console. Next up is the Cisco 3825 router that provides all the network routing for the setup. And next are the monitors that give us the consoles for each of the three D-Dial nodes. These are four inch black and white broadcast monitors. But believe it or not, they have a far crisper picture than the camera captured here. Of course, these are displaying 40 column text, but even at 80 columns, it's very readable despite this being a four inch monitor. Obviously, I need a way to cross-connect individual POTS extensions between various things, so this is the DMARC. The two 66 blocks on the left are the actual demarcation point between the phone network itself and the internal wiring. You'll note that there are bridging clips in the middle, which I can use to isolate the internal wiring from the actual POTS line for diagnosis. This is the same way that phone companies did it for decades. The block on the right has all the permanent cabling of the rack on it, and the blue and white wires cross-connect from the DMARC over to the cables that feed all the modems. The extra cables at the bottom go out to other things such as phones throughout my house, to the BBS which sits on my desk in my office room, and other stuff. Finally, we come to the channel bank. This specific bank is an 8 at 600 model loaded with FXS 8 port cards. The TDM controller card on the left takes in two T1 lines and then maps each channel to a physical port on the back side of the unit, which is terminated in an RJ21 style 25 pair Amphenol connector, one per T1. Now remember earlier I mentioned that there is no phone company at play here. One of the common confusions that people have when I describe this setup is that they don't realize that the T1s coming into the back of this channel bank come out of the back of the asterisk PBX server at the bottom of the rack. There's absolutely nothing between those two devices except for cable. So now we have some idea about what each of the things in my rack are, but I haven't really explained yet how this all works. When you tell that to Diversidial or my BBS, your connection is first answered by a virtual machine, which contains custom software that I wrote years ago, which will prompt you to make a selection first of all, because otherwise various malware and hackbots on the interwebs will try to wear out all the vintage tech behind the scenes here. 
Once you've answered the challenge, that software patches in the annex which selects an idle serial connection to a modem for you, which you can see with the green arrow here. Once this is done, my software dials the originate modem to connect you to the service that you wanted. When the connection is established, the software turns over interactive control to the caller. But what about going the opposite direction? How do I use a modem to be able to tell net other things on the internet? Well, to start with, each of the modems are configured to auto-answer. The phone switch is configured with the hunt group to find one that isn't busy. So I just call the annex from whatever I want to connect and get an annex prompt. From there, I can tell net to whatever I want to. Okay, so another big question that I get all the time is why? Well, usually I say, why not? I am a modem collector first and foremost, and I'm not sure why I would collect things if I didn't have an interest in making them work. Second, I say, you know, we didn't have Wi-Fi or Ethernet cards back in the day. We used modems, so again, why not? And beyond that, my early interest in Diversidile really inspired my career in information technology, and I wanted to preserve it by putting it online with real hardware. The software only supports modems, so I had to build this setup in order to do this. Anyhow, that's a quick explanation of my setup, how it works, why I built it, and why I continue to maintain it for all my users. If you haven't yet, you should probably call the longest continuously running Apple II BBS in the modern era, DJ's Place. Telnet to bbs.impact.net and you'll get connected. Likewise, you should connect to the only operating Diversidile chat system in the world, see what the precursor to IRC looked like in 1985, and chat with others on networked multi-user chat on an Apple II. Telnet to d-dial.com and you'll get connected. Like I mentioned in an earlier comment, I'm going to do some follow-ups to this video to show other methods that you can do the exact same thing that I'm doing here, just with less expense and or complication. Modems are my passion, so if you have any questions, please post them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Be sure to click like if you enjoyed this video, and share it with your friends. If you can, please consider supporting my efforts on Patreon with the link in the video description below. Also, check out my Facebook page. Until next time, I'll see you then. Bye.